Welcome. We are now going to do the last chapter, chapter 11, where we're looking at abnormal behavior across a lifespan. Now, this just usually means that the things that are associated here are things that people are born with and they live throughout their life with the same sort of disorder. So the, the psychological problems experienced by children and young people who are often especially poignant in that they affect children at a time in their lives when, you know, you have relatively little ability to cope. Now some problems of childhood, um, of childhood prevent children from reaching their potential. Others mirror the problems faced by adults. Now finally, there are some problems unique to childhood or disorders that, are, um, that manifest themselves differently in children compared to adults. So what is considered normal and or abnormal for children? Now it must be considered in light of other developmental issues in addition to factors such as ethnicity or even gender. So what is acceptable behavior uh, at age one becomes unacceptable as the child grows older. Now consider the following example. Now these examples are brief and they're not, in, uh, not intended to provide enough information to make any diagnosis as any parent might be able to say that their son or daughter does these things. These examples are just trying to differentiate between disorders, okay? So let's look at a couple here, or a few. Eight-year-old Penny cannot tolerate having her parents out of sight. Upon arrival at school, Penny clings to her mother, refuses to leave the car, and as her mother walks her to the classroom, Penny cries, screams, and begs her mother not to leave. Now again, it's very brief and it's not a complete consideration, but the diagnosis in this instance was considered to be separation anxiety disorder. Let's look at another, and again, again, I have to say, these are just brief. They are not the kinds of things you'd make a diagnosis on with this limited amount of information. They're just to give you examples. Ten-year-old Philip's parents are frustrated by Philip's continuing defiance, constant arguments, and vindictiveness. Today, Philip is refusing to come out of his bedroom to greet friends and relatives attending his mother's surprise birthday party. He shouts at his parents, you can't make me do anything. Diagnosis, oppositional defiant disorder. Now sitting in a psychologist's office, the mother explains that ever since he was in preschool, her son Billy, who is now 10, has disrupted the classroom instruction. He has difficulty concentrating and falling, um, sorry, uh, concentrating and is failing most subjects. Throughout the session, Billy fidgets and interrupts his mother. Diagnosis, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Another, five-year-old Hamed sits apart from the other children, spinning the wheels of a truck and humming as loud, you know, aloud as, he, um, as if he's mimicking the sounds. Hamed seems to live in a world of his own, interacting with those around him as if they were inanimate objects. Diagnosis, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Now we're going to start with the neurological development disorders and then we're going to move into the disruptive impulsivity control and conduct disorders and that will be all in part one. In the second part, which will also be in this week, we'll look at anxiety and depression in childhood and adolescence followed by neurocognitive, neurocognitive disorders. All right, so we're going to begin with the Neural Developmental Disorders of Autism Spectrum Disorder. Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, is one of the most severe childhood disorders. Autism Spectrum Disorder is characterized by pervasive deficits in the ability to relate to and communicate with others, and by a restricted range of activities and interests. Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder lack the ability to relate to one another and it seems that they live in their own private worlds. Autism Spectrum Disorder involves marked deficiencies in, in multiple areas of development. Now these deficits, de um, these deficits develop within the first year of life and are often associated with intellectual disabilities. 
Now, features of autism spectrum disorder shun affectionate behavior, engage in stereotypical behavior, attempting to preserve sameness, engage in peculiar speech habits such as echolalia, pronoun reversal, and idiosyncratic speech. The cause of disorder remain unknown, and it's a lifelong condition. It is a spectrum disorder, therefore uh, there is a range of severities. Now some of the early views, when we think about the theoretical perspectives of autism spectrum disorder, there's early views of the 50s looked at the pathological family relationships. That is to say that the cold, detached parents affected the development of autism in some children. This was a common position for very many disorders, that is to say, blaming the parents. Um, this was, a uh, sorry, research does not support blaming parents anymore. Psychologist O. Ivar Lovas focused more on perceptual deficits and be able to process one stimuli at a time. Now there's been a lot of talk certainly about you know the role of vaccinations. There isn't any evidence that vaccinations cause uh, autism. In fact the research that was done has been debunked by many other researchers and has had its um, research removed from journals. Uh, so it's very unfortunate that that belief about vaccinations is going forward. Cognitive theories, if we look at the cognitive perspective about autism spe spectrum disorder, we look at the relationships between integrating information from various senses and hypersensitivity. Uh, hypersensitivity and hyposensitivity to stimuli. Now this would impede what psychologists call theory of mind hypothesis. The theory of mind hypothesis is the separation and acceptance that there is a you and others and they're different. Uh, and that's an important variable in particular for this understanding of autism. MRI scans show differences from non-autistic brains including the connective tissue between the two lobes or the two halves of the brain, the, corp the corpus callosum. Now this lateralization, here you've got your brain lobes and this in between, this lateralization difference may also suggest a cause feature. Neuro, neurodevelopmental de uh, deficits look like they could also be important. This view looks at genetic and therefore chromosomal suspicions for a cause. Now when we think of in terms of treatment, there is no cure for autism spectrum disorder. However, intensive behavioral intervention, IBI, which are structured treatment programs, have had some successes, particularly when they are started early. Biological options are limited, is, uh, limited in their success. Uh, they have been, and there has been some early success with computer programs, like FaceSay is the name of a program which helps students and it teaches them more social skills and emotion recognition in terms of what faces do when they're emotionally charged and gives them insights as to what things mean. Carrying on, if we look at intellectual disabilities, intellectual dis uh, developmental disorder, intellectual disabilities are also called intellectual developmental disorders and they involve a broad delay in the development of cognitive, social, and social functioning. In many cases, intellectual disability can be traced to biological causes, uh, including chromosomal and genetic disorders. Infectious diseases and brain damage, damage can also be linked to um, intellectual disability disorder. The most common chromosomal abnormality resulting in intellectual disability is what's known as Down syndrome. Other genetic abnormalities, including Fragile X syndrome, um, phenoketonura, uh, PKU, and Tay-Sachs disease. Other than chromosomal abnormalities, intellectual disabilities may be caused by prenatal factors such as maternal disease and alcohol and other drug use. There are some cultural familial factors associated with intellectual, uh, intellectually impoverished home environments having some role to play in that diagnosis. We can include under the same heading that we've been working with is specific learning disorders. 
Specific learning disorders is a deficiency in a specific learning ability noteworthy because of the individual's general intelligence of the individual's general intelligence and exposure to learning opportunities. In the DSM-5 classifies specific learning disorders as a single disorder with three subsets. Impairment in mathematics, impairment in written expression, and impairment in reading. All right. So you will have seen or read about, and you'll see referenced in your textbook a bit, about the different learning disorders that may affect some people. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, uh, ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by excessive motor activity, impulsivity, and or the inability to focus one's attention. So there's the misnomer about the heading. It's not attention deficit. It's attention magnification, if you will. It's the inability to focus attention on just one thing. You're bombarded with so many things that you find it a particular disruption. Stimulant, me stimulant medication is generally effective in reducing the hyperactivity, but it doesn't lead to a general academic gains. Cognitive behavioral treatments help children with ADHD adapt better into a, in a school environment. If we look at another disorder, disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders, it's a grouping. We can look at conduct disorder, CD, um, purposefully engage in patterns of antisocial behavior and violating social norms and the rights of others. The DSM-5 lists two types of conduct disorders. There's the, there's the childhood onset type. Symptoms appear before the child is of age 10. And then there's an adolescent onset type. Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD, is a disorder occurring in childhood or adolescence and is characterized by excessive oppositionality or tendencies to refuse requests from parents and others. Now this isn't, and again, uh, it would be helpful if you ever have the opportunity to look at a DSM-5 and review some of the criteria by which diagnoses are made. I think this one is in your textbook as well. And looking at this, you could say, well, my child always seems to say no to me. And they are defiant. But if you look at the criteria, you may find the difference that makes child just saying no from time to time different from the child who fits under ODD. Many children with conduct disorders, especially boys, display aggressive behavior and have problems controlling their anger. Behavior therapy and other psychosocial interventions may be helpful in modifying behaviors of children with a conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. So that sort of sums up the first part, and we're going to jump into the second part, because I think we can do this in one video. So let's carry on with what we will now look at are the anxiety and depression in childhood and adolescence. And we'll start with the separation anxiety disorder. Separation anxiety disorder is a childhood disorder characterized by extreme fears of separation from parents and others from whom the child is dependent. The development of separation anxiety disorder frequently follows a stressful life event such as an illness, a death of a relative or a pet, or a change of schools or homes. Now in many cases we will have this experience with our children maybe early on in life and once they start to see that this is okay, they move on from this and it doesn't become a future problem. For it to become a disorder, it must be something that reoccurs and is continuous and may continue to carry on for a longer period of time. So what are some perspectives of an, on anxiety disorder in childhood? Well, the psychoanalytic theorists, they argue that childhood anxieties and fears, like their adult counterparts, symbolize unconscious, unconscious conflicts. Now remember, that's a big part of psychoanalytic, is looking back in childhood experiences. The cognitive theorists, they focus on the role of cognitive biases underlying anxiety reactions. So really just saying that we overemphasize, even in childhood, some things because we don't have good perspective and so everything seems to be big. Learning theorists suggest that the occurrence of a generalized anxiety may touch on broader themes such as fears of rejection or failure that carry across situations. And so these difficulties, these challenges 
uh, in treatment, trying to find the right treatment, are that some of these conditions are rooted deeper in regards to their treatment. They might be more deeper than just biological. They could have more of a genetic, hormonal, or imbalances. Depression in childhood and adolescence. Depressed children in adolescence typically show a greater sense of hopelessness display more cognitive errors and negative attributions. Now that shouldn't make any, it be any surprise because they haven't got the skill set and the ability yet to see that sort of broader perspective. And so you're likely to have more cognitive errors. You're not developed your whole cognitive skill set yet. So things like blaming themselves for negative events is common, more common in children and therefore could have that kind of effect. As we get older, we recognize that sure, we might be part of the problem, but there might be other things a part of the issue as well. They may also have lower perceived competence or self-efficacy and have a lower self-esteem than do their non-depressed counterparts. Now that was found in research from 2013. Now they often report episodes of sadness, crying, apathy, as well as insomnia, fatigue, and poor appetite. They may refuse to attend school, express fears of their parents dying and clinging to their parents to, or retreat from their, uh, to their rooms. They may have suicidal thoughts or even attempt suicide. Depression may also be masked by other problems such as conduct, or school-related problems, physical complaints, or overactivity. And unfortunately, related to depression and anxiety in children is the issue of suicide among children and adolescents. The rates of suicide climb with age. As we get older, those rates increase. Rising from 1.9 in 100,000 between the ages of 10 and 14 years of age to 7.7 .7 out of 100,000 between the ages of 15 and 19. That's from Stats Canada in 2017. Among youth ages 15 and over, the rates are greater for males than females, and that shows true in adulthood as well, and the rates are five to seven times greater for First Nations youth. If we move into the neurocognition disorders, neurocognition disorders are caused by physical or medical diseases or drug use or withdrawal that affects the brain's functioning. Now the three, these disorders, they arise when the brain is either damaged or impaired in its ability to function because of injury, illness, exposure to toxins or the use and abuse of psychoactive drugs. And so this, you're not born with as much as you can achieve and it can have a long-term impact over life. Now the condition known as delirium, now delirium is a state of extreme mental confusion in which people have difficulty focusing in their attention, speaking clearly and coherently, and orientating themselves to the environment. The prevalence of delirium is estimated to be about 1 to 2 percent of the general community, but it rises to about 14 percent when people are aged or, uh, or over the age of 85. So delirium um, is something that you will see alongside um, Alzheimer's going towards delirium uh, and dementia. And the idea that people can go out and move and then start to lose sight of where they are, their speech can be affected, it's a, it's a huge and will become a bigger issue as the population to continues to age. Now treatment typically involves medication, um, environmental changes, and family support when it comes to uh, dementia. The major neurocognitive disorder or dementia, this is very big, it's commonly called dementia. It represents a profound decline or deterioration in mental functioning characterized by significant impairment in memory, thinking processes, attention, and judgment by specific cognitive deficits. The most frequent cause is the disabling and degenerative brain disease called Alzheimer's. Notice how I said that. Dementia is the condition. Alzheimer's is a path to that. Now, Alzheimer, Alzheimer's is not the only path to dementia, but it's the most common, the one we're probably most familiar. Alzheimer's is not 
dementia. Alzheimer's is the disease where dementia might be the end result. Now, um, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by memory loss and deterioration in other cognitive functions, including the judgment and ability to reason. Scientists are exploring the underlying processes of Alzheimer's disease, and they're focusing on uh, the loss of synapses in the brain. In addition, um, the formation of what are known as amyloid plaques and neurofib neurofibrillar neurofibrillary tangles. Sorry about that. And they're seen in the brain uh, with those with attention with sorry with Alzheimer's disease. So they see the relationship between these physical shifts and changes in the brain and the onset of Alzheimer's towards dementia. And that, of course, is a debilitating, very debilitating circumstance um, of which there is no cure for at this point either. All right, so there we are. We are done in abnormal psychology. All it's left to do is for me to mark assignments and you to do the final test. Congratulations and good luck to you in your future, and I hope all goes well with you. Bye now.